podcasting land we are back with another episode of fighting the void and today i am rejoined by my lovely co-host crystal hello back from her various travels and illnesses and other things that come up in the in the life of your average young zoomer yeah you are officially a zoomer correct is that what gen z's like Yes, that's the, that is a new derogatory term. You're welcome. Oh, Zoomer. I, I wow. didn't invent it. I, I saw it and I'm like, I like it though. <laughs> so, and uh, today uh, we have a, another guest. We have Brian Smith of the Truth Cigars in the American Way podcast. And he stopped by to chat with us about getting into podcasting, why, all of that fun stuff. And we might get into some other things a little bit later on, like, you know, using Twitter as a dating app, for example. <laughs> you no. know, crazy stuff like that. That was pure accident. That was pure accident. Same here. Same I know. Here. I we know. could talk about that. Like, we, we have two people on here who could talk about that. Well, we could. And in all honesty, I think I've talked about this before. Heck, let's just jump right into this because it's fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm actually, I think I've talked about this before, but I'm actually a pioneer in internet dating. Thank you very much. I met my wife on Yahoo Personals, which doesn't even exist anymore. No. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. That was <laughs> essentially amongst the first uh, in, internet dating things. It was like, you know, you think of personal ads in the paper like that, but on the internet and with pictures. Huh. So you would literally just type in whatever basic criteria it is that you had and just scroll right on through. Oh, wow. And I came across my wife's profile. You know, I remember doing it. I was like just scrolling through. And I was like, you know, well, there's, there's a lot of, you know, a, attractive women and everything on there. But it's all like, like, you know, just reading. I was like, I'm different. I like to have fun and oh. party and, you know, some some random uh so some random chick with like your tongue sticking out or making the duck lips or something for the selfie i'm like I'm no no <laughs> no none of that like honestly i would see something like that and be like nope scrolling right on by honestly, I don't I don't blame you. what's that honestly i don't blame you and that really shows you how long ago got that was because now it's a bad thing to say not like other girls Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, by back then I considered it to be a clear indicator that you're just like every other girl. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> and hence why I was scrolling through all of those all, all of those things. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Uh, because I wasn't interested in just dating. I was actually yeah. like, you know what? No, I'm looking for something serious here. And this this ain't it. <laughs> That's that's pretty much that's pretty much the same mindset I was in when when I was like you know like eighteen and it's like okay I'm ready to like be on the scene and whatnot but it's like I my mindset was never like oh I want to date around I was like I want someone that's like in it mm -hmm. right. for for the long term and so, right right for the long haul so that sounds like I was expecting a lot right away it wasn't it just meant I I when I went into it I was expecting to like find someone to be with for a long time but it's like that's the mindset i had and that's why i never <laughs> i hated the idea of finding my partner online <laughs> i was like i want to meet them in real life okay i don't want to meet them online and it's like over time especially now on twitter <laughs> that's what happened <laughs> well yes. it's really funny is um someone made the observation one time is that those uh, more traditional ways of uh, uh, dating online, mm -hmm. right? You have eHarmony, you have Match.com, right. you have that. The, the, uh, the recognized way. ways, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's more comparable to window shopping, right? Yes. As to And they made the observation about Twitter where it's like on Twitter, um, everyone's more, for better or worse, authentic, right? And so yeah. that you actually get to get a better view of what a person is than with these other, other uh, options. That's true. Oh, yeah. And especially if you actually take the time and interact and spend yeah. some time talking back and forth and everything. And it, it grows somewhat 
organic. Well, actually, Brian, why don't you go ahead and tell, tell us your experience? Because I think yeah. it's possible it's possible that you're most famous as as Mr. Laurel. Uh, no, she she has oh she, she, a lot more following than I do, <laughs> um, and people still get surprised that we're together or that she's actually dating anyone. Um, but see, uh, before I start off, I want to say that I'm no way in uh, advocating as using Twitter as a dating site. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Dude. But if it works out, it works out. <laughs> yes. Um, so it was just. Um, Actually, the first interaction I ever had with her, she made me mad because it, uh, Michael Knowles had used uh, the uh, 23andMe or Ancestry.com. I'm not sure. I don't remember which one it was. But he had sent that in, and he got the results back. And I commented saying, uh, I'm not uh, – I don't like doing this. Like, I'm not saying he shouldn't do it, but I don't like doing this because these companies, they're uh, – now have the right to do whatever they want with your DNA. Mm -hmm. And so then she comes along. I didn't know it was she at the time. Um, said, uh, made us some snarky comment about uh, having a clone Michael Knowles. And then like whole other people got involved saying like, you know, talking about an army of clone Michael Knowles. And so that was the first time my uh, notifications blew up. And that is <laughs> that's a really... Uh, take me off, and um, so then again, I, I I talked to her later on down the line. Uh, you know, she I found that she wasn't as bad uh, <laughs> as that first experience, and you know, slowly over time, uh, we kind of became friends. Uh, you know, we kind of uh, hung around in the same circles on on Twitter, we got to know each other better and better, and better. And then her just being her had a hugely positive impact on my life. You know, I was I was being a very cliche young twenty year old. You know, not uh, not doing much, just working, partying, and being interested in women in all the wrong ways. Uh -huh. And then her being just a tremendous person and a, a good Christian. You know, uh, you know a lot of people get the idea that in order to have a positive influence through Christ uh, or but to other people and bringing them to Christianity, you have to always talk about God and bring him up. We were right. in the conversation talking about how he's great. And, you know, that may, uh, that might work sometimes, but in my experience, it push, pushes more, most people away. And so the best way to do it, I think, and what Laurel did was just live in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really affected me and, you know, changed me a lot. And then, uh, you know, I, my life fell apart uh, one day and, you know, she, she stuck by me when everyone else was uh, left and we just went from there. Aww. That is, that is a good story. That is very sweet. I, I know anyone that knew it seemed like anyone that knew both of you at the time at the time that you all kind of became Twitter official. Uh, I don't think anyone that actually had seen you guys interact was terribly surprised. No, no one was surprised. I know I wasn't. I was like, oh well, duh. <laughs> I feel like I feel like that's a growing trend, but I think it's more so because um like it happened on Twitter you can see how the two interact with each other and how like how it feels when they both interact and it's like you can see like the way they talk to each other about because like brian that that's the exact situ uh, situation lucas and i were in like when when we announced we were together everyone like including ginger was like oh i am so shocked <laughs> yeah yeah i was like it was like uh-huh yeah it's good. I'm glad you didn't make sure I was sitting down before telling me that because I could have hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> Take it back. I think you, Ginger, were more like it. It took y'all this long. Pretty much. Yeah, I mean that's fair. I mean that's fair. I think my uh, utterly the least, was... possibly the least surprising thing I've ever heard in my life. Anyway, <laughs> that's fair. I think my family called it too. They're oh. like they were starting to make jokes and comments before we even got together. 
<laughs> yeah, well, so uh, so yeah, that that was an unu- that was an unplanned start to this whole thing. <laughs> Brian, did you have something you want to add? Sorry. No, it was just uh, you know, me and her, uh, we had to go through some uh, channels to to make sure that it was okay with everyone first before we made it official. Gotcha, gotcha. Aww. Oh, but uh, I did want to add too, real quick. I think what, and again, like Brian, I do not advocate looking for your partner on Twitter because um, it, it's Twitter, just saying. But uh, I feel like what partially works too is that like going into it, there really isn't the expectation of I'm looking for someone today. Right. I, I think that kind of helps as well because with like, like eHarmony and all those things. It's like there's the expectation of we're going to go on a date. And I that, I that makes I think that especially makes a lot of people act weird on those apps and whatnot. But it's like in our cases, it wasn't like I, I didn't start talking to Lucas expecting to start dating him. I just started talking to him because like he seemed cool and he was interested in my writing and he and we became friends and yada 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 so i think that's a um factor as well yeah i mean the the eHarmony and so on and so forth they're kind of like the internet version of going to the bar to pick to to pick someone up yeah or or to get picked up what have you uh you know it's it's highly it's largely superficial at least if you're jumping right in, it's tending to jump right into into dating and not take doing a little back and forth first yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, social media, generally speaking, not not just Twitter, is a little bit more like uh, getting to know that person that always that is always at the coffee shop when you're at, when you're there. Yeah. It's a little bit more like that. Unless you're Facebook and you're making a dating app. Unless <sighs> you're Facebook. Face, Facebook. Does it? Uh, who? Who does Facebook anymore, anyway? I mean, my family. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, Obviously, yeah, millions of people still actually use it, but I it legit- seems like the younger you get, the less likely it is. I wouldn't have a Facebook if it weren't for the fact I needed it for a screenwriting lab I took. Right, right. And even then, it's only for family. So, um, after um, after social media dating advice here on Fighting the Void podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, Brian. Uh, you have your own podcast, Two Cigars in the American Way. Um, one, what made you decide to actually try to get into the whole, uh, you know, political punditry podcasting world? And what actually is the inspiration for the name of the podcast? Uh, well, I'll get to the second uh, one uh, first because that's the easiest. Uh, someone had suggested it on Twitter. I, I'm not good with naming things, so I, I put it to people to other people, and you know they got that one. I thought it had a nice ring to it, so I was like, yeah. It does have a nice ring to it. Yeah. It does. I like it. I've, I've asked other people, like my previous uh, co-host, uh, Hadassah, who's out mm-hmm. for, for a little while now, you know, what she thought of it. You know, she th- said it had a nice ring to it, so we stuck with it. Um, as for what got me into it was... Well, first, I just wanted to kind of just put out what I, what my opinions were, mm-hmm. uh, but I knew I was no good at talking to myself, looking at a camera for however long, you know, writing a script, doing mm-hmm. you know, good editing and stuff like that. Right. It was just not for me. So, you know, I figured, well, get someone on with me. Uh what I was wanting to do is get someone who had more different opinions than me on. Okay. So we could actually have more discussions, but I don't know very many people that have different opinions. Than me. <laughs> and, well, I do, but uh, we're in the same circle of opinions, but that's divided up into subsections. Like we have different oh. subsection opinions, but on the greater amount whole, we, we think the same stuff. Right. So that that was really hard. And so, you know, we try to bring on guests that have different opinions, but no one wants to come on. Uh, or at least no one who would have different opinions wants to come on. Uh, which we can talk about, you know, has to, uh, later with uh, 
you know, political division in America right now. Um, but, you know, I, I just wanted to offer something different uh, because first of all, I put my opinions on there. Then uh, I saw that everyone was putting their opinions out there. So I was like, well, there's not very many people discussing things. They're just telling, they're just out there telling them what they think. I was like, well, right. Okay, then why don't we just have a discussion, which, which seems to be very lacking right now. And so that's what I wanted to do. And I was just tired of things going on and, and me feeling so uh, helpless and, and useless not to do anything. So even though like my channel is not very big right now, I still feel like, you know, I, I'm doing what I can. And, um, you know, it, it's very enjoyable. I enjoy what I do. And, so even if it doesn't ever grow, I, it's, I still enjoy it and I'll continue to do it. Well, that, and that's exactly the right attitude to have, especially in the market that is so incredibly saturated with this with this sort of thing. I mean, I think we've been at this crystal now for over a year, over over a year, over a year, and well, let's just say it's a subscriber ch chart account. YouTube ain't charge of the rules it isn't going to change the rules on our account anytime soon. Put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, we we passed fifty. I mean, Which is good. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, honestly, I, I'm wait, I'm I'm waiting to hit the magic hundred mark before yeah. before I actually start seriously thinking about doing some other stuff. But I mean, yeah, year and a half or or so, and you know, fifty some odd subscribers. You know. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to get there, and you know, let's face it. Uh, uh, like like yourself, Brian, we don't do a whole whole lot in the way of scripting. There's obviously no uh, no additional production or anything going on. Uh, the most closest we've come to that actually was getting blindfold Bethany to design uh, new profile pics and logo for us. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> which she did a great which she did a great job, and I'm just sorry I did took so long actually like, getting it up there. <laughs> Yeah, but, and, it, and it actually portrays me as a ginger. So it does. It does. That so makes ginger happy. It 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 did. I'm not gonna lie. I was kind of like, <laughs> 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 it, it, it was it, it was good. But in any case, yeah, and it is definitely a tough. It's a tough slog. It's not anything that. I mean, even the big guys, even like even someone like Steven Crowder, his subscriber counts are dwarfed by people that just play video games for a living. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which frankly is depressing. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it like it makes sense because I, I feel like the majority of people come online to get away from politics, to yeah. be fair. Well, and I also think, uh, I also think not that many people pay that much attention to it because it's a reflection uh, in Brian, it, it, I actually be curious of your opinion on this. Uh, it seems to be a reflection of the same sort of mentality that pays, you know, millions and that winds in baseball players getting paid millions and millions of dollars every year. It's the same sort of thing. You know, you know I'm putting my money into going and getting my favorite player's jersey and this, that, and all of that jazz. Um, the same kind of mentality goes into I'm going to watch somebody play Fortnite online and that's going to wind up in that result of that person getting you know a ridiculous amount of money or it seems like a ridiculous amount of money for playing video games this is it seems like the same mindset to me and I, most people when they get home from work at the end of the day assuming they have jobs just want to be entertained for the most part yeah they don't want to have to think about um whatever latest scandal it is that's on the evening news or um or or certainly not drilling deeper i think it's a different target audience though too because it's a different topic like gaming yeah. let's be honest is more a universal thing that can attract multiple people than stephen crowder is because the mm -hmm. people attracted to stephen crowder are going to be people who already hold yeah. the aligned with his or people willing to listen no. to different opinions. Well, he's the, I, I just kind of picked him randomly as an example, but, but you know, I mean, you could throw it works on the left too, because yeah. the 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 ratings the the ratings for uh, 
all the mainstream news shows are much lower than they used to be. Yeah. Oh. In any case. Um, but Brian, I actually, I do appreciate your, your discussion style on, on your show. Um, I've noticed that you don't, you get beyond just doing like the typical hot takes and just kind of recycling that over and over and over again for about half an hour. <laughs> yeah. Cause I've definitely noticed that in a lot of, even a lot of the bigger guys, I'll notice that it's like, okay, here's my topic. It's very narrow, but I'm going to go into that very narrow topic. And basically just repeat it a lot for 20 minutes or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, we probably could have summed this up in about five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing is with any, any topic, you know, there, there's ext extremities isn't the right word, but outside things that, that contribute, contribute to it, you know, and there's very different aspects to it, you know, like, uh, you 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 started talking to me first about the deep platforming uh, episode, mm. right? So you know when talking about deep platforming, uh, you know people tend to say that it's always right or always wrong. It's like well, maybe there's some instances where it's wrong and some instances where it's right. Um, you know uh, if someone on, on Twitch because this is the what had we were, the in, the what we were talking about in that episode with someone on Twitch saying something and if uh, i haven't looked at twitch's uh terms of service but if it did break their terms of service then they are right to get rid of them yeah I, I, I believe the, uh, then they I, are wrong too I, I believe the catalyst for that was um hassan uh peaker from young turks yes uh with all of his comments on crenshaw yes <laughs> okay yeah and yeah that it is a tricky thing legitimately the whole deep platforming uh discussion because as a general rule, I'd say no, no, don't, don't deplatform. But yeah, there are definitely cases where, yeah, you you kick them off. I mean, just just to pick something, you know, just to go to an obvious extreme, which has existed, strangely enough, but it's one we can all agree on. You know, mm -hmm. if, if 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 ISIS is putting out videos of burning people alive in cages, I think we can all agree. They, we can all agree. They, they should get. Be, you know, shunt it off to the side. Yes. <laughs> you know, at the very, you know, they should be burned in a digital cage at, at the very least. And yeah, uh, you know, but obviously you get into something where like, okay, Peaker's comments. That's, that's pretty horrible. And beyond just the obvious offense to, uh, to Crenshaw and to um, other veterans, which uh, Peter, obviously, I'm sure, would have zero respect for. He's actually talking about supporting enemies of the country. <laughs> yes. Which is, and then not just enemies of the country, not just you know ideological opponents. Well, I call them jihadist heroes, soldier heroes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Not not just ideological opponents, but people actually act actively out there killing people in horrible ways. It's like, yeah, I'm. Let's put it this way. I'm not going to scream and yell if somebody deplatforms you. I, let, let's be honest here. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. it's different. You see, it's like you're, you're not debating just ideas at that point. You're actually saying these guys, these these terrorists who are out there killing innocent people on purpose, not, not collateral damage, like this is the goal. You're supporting them. You're going to go to the corner with you. <laughs> Yeah, but now um, beyond uh, beyond just you know getting started in podcasting, do you have like a like a long term vision for the podcast at all? Um, well, eventually, I, I would like to change my background. Um, <laughs> but other than that, uh, really, no. I, I've um, kind of. When I was looking for more content for the channel, mm -hmm. I, I played with the idea of getting other small pack podcasters together, two other shows, something on, so we could uh, post content throughout the week, so mm -hmm. we could, so we could uh, generate more uh, attention, and then you know maybe that could be develop develop into something more. Because I've also played with the idea of a, you know, a digital news site, uh, but you know that takes money. And, and time and money and time I do not have, so you know it. 
just ideas I played around if given the opportunity, but uh, right now it's just I'm focused on the now and it's just keep going. Okay, you know, actually, um, it sounds honestly like you've had thoughts similar to some of my own. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe we should talk after we uh, after we end the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> because, yes, I, I've had similar thoughts going in very similar directions. Yeah. As far I, as uh, how to actually build, actually build something that makes a little bit more of a difference than just yeah, talking at a camera and hoping a few people are listening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really get really uh, generated the idea uh, with with the more content. It was, well, I always knew that we would need more content than just once a week to right. generate. Because, you know, if you look at, you know, the YouTube algorithm and like PewDiePie, the reason why he's so successful is he puts about, uh, you know, 15 to 25 minute videos every mm -hmm. day. You know, and so he's just flooding the market with his videos, which gives him more views. And so, you know, that's something uh, I would do if, if I had the time. But uh, so ge just generating more content will help a lot. And uh, wait, back to my original point. I'm, I'm just bouncing all over the place. Um, when the copyright instance happened during the second Democratic debates, mm -hmm. uh that's why I knew that, you know, I couldn't like solely do it on my own mm -hmm. because, you know, that just really hit the uh, channel hard because leading up to that, I, I've noticed after I checked my anal analytics, you know, I was getting about 50 views or so per episode. And then mm -hmm. after that, it's been 15 ish, 10. Ah. So that's not very helpful at all. So they put you in the digital ghetto. Yes. Nice. That's always fun, but yeah, I have, I have no idea. <laughs> so, I don't know. So yeah, just you know, wanted to create, uh, wanted a way to provide more content, but also wanted a way to make sure that you know, I was easily uh, it would have been easy to take me down. Right, right. Well, yeah, yeah I think that's an argument against uh, trying to get. Try, trying to do exactly what some of the big guys are doing because even the big guys have trouble with that sort of thing. Yeah. You oh, know, yeah. I, I mean, how, how many, yeah, I, I mean, how many times has Crowder had to fight off a copyright strike? Or sometimes multiple copyright strikes for the same thing, even after one of them gets taken away. Yes, but they have the clout to fight it. Well, yeah, well my, that's my point exactly. They've got the clout to fight it. They've got, uh, you know, they, they've got their half Asian lawyer, and you know, and like a four million plus su subscriber count to be like, okay, um, we think you're full of crap, and we are. We can call you on it, and we will. <laughs> well, even then, sometimes they um, have a hard time finding it. Oh yeah, they still have a hard time I, fighting it. I, yeah. I don't know about uh, Glam and Gore because um, uh, there's this YouTuber, Mikey, her channel name is Glam and Gore because she would do both makeup and special effects. Oh, cool. Yeah, but uh, she's she's recently explained that she has a hard time monetizing her special effects makeup videos because, you know, her specialty is horror makeup. Like, that's, okay. that's where she... That's where she started off working was doing horror makeup for gotcha. a house and whatnot. And it's like because of the, you know, terms and services of no blood and gore, Disturbing which serving imagery, yada yada. Yeah. Yeah. Which like in general sounds great, but for people like Glenn and Gore or Mikey, sorry, Mikey, who do special effects makeup, they can't monetize their stuff because the algorithm just sees, oh hey, that's blood. Eh, bad. So she right. has a hard time with that. She's recently had to take away a gimmick of hers because it includes a copyrighted song. Ugh. Yeah, and um, and there's a there's <laughs> funny enough the gamer that Lucas and I like to watch Maximilian. Mm -hmm. He has a ton of subscribers and he's really big on Twitch, but he has to repeatedly fight with YouTube about his videos because they either get, either get taken down. Or mm -hmm. like he's done, he's done these videos that are like big production, like um, 
he temporarily had quite a few of them down, one of which was a alien fan film that he and his friends did, which was like high quality. Like the it looked like the alien from the movie high quality. Nice film that they did and it got struck down. So they so it was temporarily down. Yeah. And it's like anytime he plays a game that has like gore or whatnot, he has to make the screen black and white so it doesn't get demonetized when they show it. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah. So even for some bigger ones, it's not easy. See, here's also the thing with co if copyright. If you get co uh, get a copyright claim on your channel, YouTube doesn't review it and say whether or not it's okay. Yeah. You pass it on to YouTube, YouTube passes it on to the claimer, and the claimer still gets to say that it's okay or not, right? And so my, in, in my case, my claim was that it was fair use because I was adding commentary. You know, I wasn't just showing the three right. debate or anything like that. I gave it to YouTube and CNN being CNN. Uh, they just said, no, nope, it's still copyright, and I've just left it alone at that. Yeah, because at that point, it's like you are kind of having to initiate legal proceedings and everything and actually start spending money which you don't have and time that you probably don't have, and they know that. It's, like, I, it's like on one hand, there's, there's what the... It's on one hand, there's the law and what the law says, and then there's actually being able to fight people that are abusing the system it's yeah. completely different those are two different things unfortunately copyright claims are, are it's getting insane how abused it is you can get copyright claimed on twitter i know because i have for a <laughs> lip syncing video i got copyrighted it's like really <laughs> like i'm not making money off of this i'm lip syncing i'm being a stupid Sick on the internet, like <laughs> I'm basic that? white girl on the internet. Leave me alone. <laughs> why don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, first of all, now, like basically, yeah, yeah. Um, now Brian, well, I guess in the light of that, in the light of getting that copyright strike, how has that affected how you go about you know deciding what you're gonna do? what you're going to do with a show in, in a given episode nothing because i don't do anything uh on regular episodes that would be copyrighted uh, uh -huh. the only thing that i do differently is i live stream on twitch instead oh, okay that's smart yeah. yes it is yes it is so all, all the shows uh live streams or twitch instead of youtube less likely to have to deal with that stuff awesome that, that is actually, that's very smart. <laughs> um, <laughs> we get a whole lot less traffic, though. Yeah. On YouTube, we get a lot of traffic during the live streams. Because that's where people look for that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. But I got to think, though, that as YouTube gets squirrelier and squirrelier, that people are going to be jumping ship for other places. The problem is not everybody's going to jump ship to the same place. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole there's a whole like fleet of life rafts out there that that the people are jumping to right now. And some of them are gonna sink, some of them are some of them are gonna make it, and who knows who knows which is which right now. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I've I've back uh I've backed up all my all my videos on the bit shoot. Mm. And I like they're they're actually doing pretty well on bit shoot right now. Uh they're getting more views than they are on YouTube. But the oh, problem with bit shoot is that it has a lot of Nazis on it. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, that is the pro that is a problem with a lot of the life rafts. Uh, yeah. A lot of life rafts may have actual rats on them, and you know um, that may. Uh, I, so the only thing to do is to outnumber the rats. Yeah, honestly, I, honestly, that is about the only thing to do is to get out there and. You know, maybe that's something too to try to organize which which raft we jump to. You know, but then, but then it's even hard to outnumber outnumber the raft because then it's like people don't want to join it because oh hey, there's a there's a bunch of things that we don't. Well, exactly, about. exactly. I mean, I, that's part of why like Gab and Parlay uh, didn't take off as Twitter replacements. Yeah, because instantly those people 
went over there and sort of took it over. It is oh, that's because they were taken off Twitter, and so the alternative is that that's going to be the first place they go. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it does make it's sense. It's inevitable. You just got to, it's yeah. inevitable. You just got to persevere and uh, really just ignore them. Yeah. Didn't the thing happen to uh, mines, or did mines just fall off the map because it just fell off the map? I think mines just fell off the map. Same thing okay. with, same thing with parlor. Yeah. Parlor. Yeah. Parlor. You know, parlor. Parlor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, all of those things they they've had their flash, but you know, flash of interest has an alternative to Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and then they just yeah. kind of. Also, I think, in large part because they got populated with actual alt right. Yeah. The, yeah, and also you have the problem of uh, user interface. Some of these things mm -hmm. don't have a great user interface, and it's just very off putting. And so they're like, so people are, try to use them, uh, you know. But you know, with so few people that are on them, they see no point in using them. Uh, with, uh, with that compounded with the poor user uh, interface, it's just not going to work. Yeah. 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 Um, Someone like like to beat out like Twitter and whatnot, you really have to create an interface better than Twitter, which is really hard to do because what because I, I I'm not gonna lie, I really love the Twitter interface. Like I don't necessarily always like how it's run. I don't necessarily always like the environment, but the interface is really good and that's why I'm constantly using it and I use it the most for yeah. my stuff and interacting. Now, um, Brian, you're you're obviously politically on the right, but would you kind of put yourself more on the conservative, the libertarian? Uh, where, where, where would you where where would you put yourself if you had to? I, that's hard to say because um, I don't like libertarians, but we do share a lot of the same views mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of you know government the, the reason why we uh the, the the disconnect there i think is libertarians uh for the most part have taken this bit of uh instead of limited government uh anti-government and um aren't really stressing the importance of uh local government or uh social fabric you know they're just very anti-government and so yeah. that, that's where I find my conflict with them. And that's why I have my pinned tweet what it is, which is uh, libertarianism without morality is anarchy. Because if you have the, like, if you were to take the social fabric today, what it mm -hmm. is, right? Yeah. And then you were to apply a uh, limited, very small government to it, everything would just fall apart. Right. And, yeah. and that's how I, that, that's how I see it. I think the founders saw it too is, in order to have a small government, you have to have a very strong moral society that has its unspoken social rules, right? And and as that as that falls, government's going to grow because something has to fill that gap. Yep. Yeah. But if you have very small, you know, societal norms, morality, and and all that, but a small government, what's left to fill that void? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we definitely can't get from here to like a minarchist type government overnight. That's for dang sure. Um, and that, that's something that I always respected about Ron Paul. He he actually he knew and admitted that, you know, but where he had his he had his ideals, he had his principles about where we needed to get to. But he understood. It's like this is gonna it's gonna take a little bit. Even to get to, you know, he's, he's like, yeah, even I actually, I actually read his uh, his campaign book the last time he ran for, for president. And it was like, and he, even when it came to foreign policy, you know, he was big. He was big, essentially, essentially an isolationist. Yeah, I disagree. Yeah. With that. And, you know, shutting down all the bases and bringing them back. But even on that, he was like, yeah, you're not going to do that overnight. Yeah, you're gonna. It's gonna have to be a gradual type of process, and it's like, okay, you know what? At least you recognize the real the, the some of the realities involved here that mm -hmm. you can't you you can't just snap your fingers 
right. and make all that happen and not have there be consequences. Yeah. So, like, I have a lot of sympathies, you know, ideals, but uh, towards mm -hmm. them, but that that's just, you know, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back there. Yeah. So, um, I guess you know, could label me as uh, conservative. You know, I, I, I just call myself like a, what's a catchy term, like trad con. Um, <laughs> Because you, uh, you know, I, I'm very traditional you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to social, mm -hmm. uh, not whatever the word, but um, you know, very with relationships and things like that. Very right. Traditional. So I, I usually just go with uh, trad con, but I, I really have no idea what that means or neoliberal or neoconservative or any of that. So I it's just like here's here's what I believe, and you know if you find the ca camp that that fits in, then that's me. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't really have the time or energy or care to figure out the the proper descriptives. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair because I feel like when people try to figure it out, it's like it it just it gets so complicated because most people aren't a black or white, a black or white. Oh, I'm this or that. Like it's it's you're ge generally a mix of multiple things. Like I'm a mix of like conservative and libertarian and da da da, da yeah. and like all the things. And um, but I I would be curious, Brian, to get your opinion. Did you say you agreed or disagreed with uh? Ginger just said his name. Uh, Ron Paul. Yeah. Ron Paul. Yeah. Ron Paul. Did you say you agreed or disagreed with him about I the isolation Disagree. i'd be curious to get your thoughts thoughts on it because i i've been really wanting to talk to someone about this for a while because a lot of libertarians to me at least seem like they're completely isolationist so it's mm -hmm. like I, 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 i'd be curious to get your thoughts because i for me i'm like but we're we're at a point in the world where it's like multiple countries have so many hands in so many other places i feel like you can't just easily like retract all of it like even when you slowly retract all of it it's like okay what do you do now 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 you're really not working with anyone or discussing discussing with anyone so it's like 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 what happens if there was like another world war ii or or what if other countries want to want to attack? It's like what what do we? Do? I hope you get what I mean. I'm rambling. Right. I'm really making sense, but so if you allow me the opportunity to plug myself, we actually did an episode yeah. on this uh, <laughs> on foreign policy. But <laughs> I think it's like episode three. Of cigars don't make you smarter. But um, so what I think is is that. Um, we can't be it, 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 we can't be completely isolationist that would be that, that would border on irresponsible to wrong, just pl flat out wrong um, can we just, let's define a quick second what when we say isolationist what are we meaning by that i think most people take it to be uh, no military forces elsewhere Okay, because I I think there's people get confused when sometimes isolationist means exactly that what you just said we don't have we're not projecting power, uh, but sometimes people also take isolationist to mean like we don't even have anything beyond absolutely necessary trade relationships with other countries. And then you have the uh, Japan idea of isolationism where you don't even trade with other people. Right, right. The imperial yeah. Japan idea. Yeah, right, right. So, I mean, and Ron Paul definitely falls in the no power projection, but right. perfectly fine with trade relationships. Yes. Okay. So here, here's why I, I, I disagree with them it, uh, is because uh, what it is, I think it is our responsibility to keep our – the libertarians say – that we shouldn't do anything unless it is within our own self-interest, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So using this argument, I say, and especially since the biggest thing right now is the Middle East, that so no one's really arguing that we we withdraw from Okinawa or South Korea or even Europe. No one's really making those arguments. They're just Middle mm -hmm. East. So here, um, 
so keeping in with that, and here's why it is in our best interest to stay in the Middle East. Because it keeps American civilians alive. It prevents another 9-11 by keeping terrorist organizations small. Right? Mm-hmm. Keeps them hidden away in the corner. It keeps the civilians there alive for the most part. You know, there's always casualties, uh, which sucks. And I wish it didn't happen, but it is it is the reality of what it is. Right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and keeping those alive, it key, uh, you have less people fleeing those regions, right? Which means less refugees to Europe and less stress of refugees to here. Mm-hmm. And also, in keeping those terrorist organizations small, it keeps European civilians alive. These are allies, civilians alive. Um, it prevents the Manchester attacks and the Paris attacks and the apparent uh, attacks in Brussels. You know, it prevents all of that. Which happened when ISIS rose to power. All those attacks happened when ISIS rose to power, and we had withdrawn from Iraq. Now I don't see those regions being what we might, what we, we might view as peaceful for any time, anytime soon, or maybe even never. But they are better now than what they could be, which I'm always for. Mm-hmm. And. Um, you know, p- people are always against this I- idea of uh, nation building, and I, I really don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't care for that. You know, when people talk about nation building, they're thinking of the George W. Bush idea of nation right. building, just taking these countries and turning them to democratic countries, trying and, to make them Western democracies. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. Uh, that requires this specific culture and attitude, yeah. and these countries do not have that. So I don't care what government they form or anything like that i just want it i want these places to be stable yeah yeah stable stable would be good yeah yeah of course even achieving that uh is is a momentous uh achievement on its own yeah but but as it stands now it is better than any other alternative as i see fit and that's why that's why i say it is in our best interest to stay there even though we're spending a lot of money there Mm-hmm. And we could be recuperating these losses um, uh, in lots of other ways. Well, really, our defense budget is minuscule to all the other amount of money that we're spending on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, but uh, it is, like I said, it is our, our best interest to stay there. And not only is it in our best interest, it is in our allies' best interest, and it is in the best interest of those people in those countries, even if they hate us. Um and I think, and I think, uh, which we, we, I don't want any. They may forever hate us, and we, I don't want. But I hope and pray that you know, with us being there, if we don't violate their customs or anything like that, they'll see that we are keeping them alive, and you know that sort of gratitude will come eventually. But I do think it is in everyone's best interest that we stay there. That's why I disagree, and also. Uh, you have the fact that if we withdraw from the world, then you have our biggest enemies, uh, which is China and Russia, uh, take advantage of that. And they they want us gone. So if we withdraw yeah. ourselves, we are just handing them everything they want on a silver platter. And yeah. that's not good for anyone. And that is the, that's the argument that I find most persuasive. It's like we, we completely pull back. It does create a power vacuum, and there are people that are very interested in filling a said vacuum. And mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know that I want China stepping in and uh, controlling the oil fields of the Middle East. Uh, most, you know, by proxy, of course. Yeah, they wouldn't be doing it directly any anytime soon. But I could see them kind of buying their way into it. And that's why I think uh, if we really wanted to help North Korea, just put a few troops there. Because like no no armed conflict would happen. China like China's military is larger in numbers than our mm-hmm. uh, ours, but we do so much for them. If any any conflict would would just be disastrous. So that, so that's why I think the best thing that we can do for North Korea is just or uh, Hong Kong, not North Korea, Hong Kong. <laughs> what some, say? Where are you going with that? <laughs> put some troops there, and it would it would help a lot. Mm, that would be dicey as all get out. I'm not sure I'm with you on that one. 
It is dicey. I'll grant you that. But because I the, because it is officially Chinese territory. Well, it, it's what what um. Now, if you put troops on Taiwan, on the other hand. Well, in, well, in, well in, China uh, claims it. It's been effectively separate for a very long time. Yeah, I think that's that's a little less. That's considerably less dicey. Yeah. Well, um, it's also something they're interested in preventing us from doing. But I, I think what, what's the, I guess, mantra of Hong Kong? It's like uh, two governments, one country, or something like that. I'm not sure. I have no idea. Oh, Ginger got interrupted. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. Uh, but, no, it's just good. Hi. But, um, I'm actually glad you pointed it out because a, a, a frequent argument used by, um, libertarians is that why should we be the world's police? You know, like, why should we police the entire world and whatnot? And it's like, <coughs> sorry, on the one hand, and, and keep in mind, I, I'm still developing an opinion on the whole four policy things. I'm still evolving my stances on all of those. But something that I've always been like caught on is that like, well, no way you're really winning, but it's isn't it better to be somewhat involved in certain things that you should be involved in? Because yeah, we shouldn't be the world's police, but at the same time, if say say with like threats of like the power threats of like Russia and China who we really don't necessarily want to have a lot of power because of how they use it. You know, like okay, so we don't step in. Who else is gonna step in? Yeah. Probably right. no one. And the, the, the big thing is I think there isn't a one size fits all policy. Yeah. Because it's precisely because as Brian identified, there are different cultures out there. There's different yeah. ways to respond to different situations that will make more or less sense depending. When it comes to the Middle East, it's let's let's face it. There, as far as I'm concerned, there are three ways to deal with it, and one is just you know what, y'all, y'all figure yourselves out. We don't care. We'll be over here, and or. There's just go in and you know what? You, this is a problem area. We're going to take it over and we're going to rule it with an iron fist. We will impose order on you whether you like it or not. And there's all, and there's the third option which is essentially, and I've outlined this before, here's your box. Do whatever you want inside that box. Don't care. You step outside that box, I'm going to put you right back in it. Which seems to be the, the which seems to be the Donald Trump policy towards the Middle East is essentially one of containment, which is personally the one I favor because it keeps keeps the res, gives you the result of things not spiraling out of control without a huge investment mm -hmm. of you know American money and lives. Yeah. Now, when it comes to China, China's a whole China. different ball of wax, yeah. and they are. They, they do have expansionist ambitions. They absolutely do. And we would do well to... Stop uh, trading with them. To, well, there's <laughs> that. And there's also... We've we've got to stop dealing with them with kid gloves, I would say. Which is to say, at the very least, we need some appropriate shows of force. Uh, when it, especially when it comes, comes to Taiwan. You just, just make it clear. It's like, you... You're not going to move on Taiwan. Yeah, we and, won't let you. Uh, well, and when it comes to Hong Kong, I think that's a place where uh, some sanctions, some ha very hard trading policies, are definitely in order. You know, like leave those people alone. And the only reason I say I don't say um, go ahead and throw some troops there is because you're literally you're literally a, a bridge away from mainland China. They can and they can very you can easily be cut off there. Yeah. And when they decide they're ready, they will do it. Uh, they just haven't decided they're ready yet. Um well uh two points first I, I wanted to say you you 
uh, Crystal one talked about us being the world police. Um, I don't think we should, uh, I agree with you. I don't think we should be the world police, but this is the position we have found ourselves in. So we need to accept that burden, right? Well, that means, yeah. Yeah. It, I didn't mean to say we I were placed here and then we have, we, right now we have no other choice. Yeah. And then, uh, you were talking about treat, uh, treating China with kid gloves. Uh, that's hard to say. Um, I think it's not just China, but all of our enemies, you know, ever since the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, we kind of forgot uh, that we, we no longer had that like moral threat. And, and the only time that happened since then, I think was, uh, I believe, cause I was just watching Steel Team 6 was uh, Osama Bin Laden and then we took care of him. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything has just kind of been really relaxed, really, if you think about it for the past several years. And so, but something people need to realize even is even though we're trading with China, they're still our enemy because they still don't like us. We're just giving them all the money they want. So they're dealing with us. Our destruction is still in their constitution. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Russia is Russia. They, they have not given up their communist sympathies, or at least Putin hasn't. And Putin's in charge of, of the government. The people uh, might not like it, but it is what it is. And so I, I think that's what it is, is a, is a large uh, forgetfulness of who our enemies are and that we need to treat them like so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. agreed. And I'd like to just clarify, I, I didn't mean to say that we should be the world's police. It was, it, it, I yeah, I, I know. I was just saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just want to clarify that for anyone else. It's not that we should be. It's like it's if a situation were to come up that could potentially negatively affect the U.S. and its people, and we can't just assume someone else is going to step in. We have to be aware of, like, when we need to step in and when we should back off. Yeah. Right. And on that note, we have reached 10 o'clock. Yeah, we are, uh, we are pretty much up on time here. So, uh, Brian, thanks again for coming on and having a little chat with us. Thank you for having me. And where can people find you and your podcast? Um, they can find my podcast at uh, TCAW Podcast on Twitter. And they can find me at Brian Smith underscore 24, capital B, capital S. Awesome. Well, all right, Brian. Again, thanks for coming on. And next week for our viewers, we will be having uh, the woman who's had an abortion. We've plugged this a couple of times. It's going to be next week, Saturday. So be here nine o'clock Eastern time for that conversation. I think it's going to be one of the more important ones that we've done here mm -hmm. on fighting the void. So Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. No offense Brian. Brian, you are the best. Okay. You are the best guest. But... <laughs> You're as the absolute best guest until next week. Uh, <laughs> and Number one. <laughs> so be, so be here for that. And then the following week, um, Red is going to be back filling in for me because I'll be taking the weekend off doing some other things. Uh -huh. And um, thank you again for tuning in. And we'll see you next week. Until then, keep fighting the good fight. Bye. Uh,